Rise of Managed Care. Uh, he also wrote The Paperless Hospital, and he encouraged hospitals to use internet-based technologies to reduce costs and reinvent healthcare delivery. And if you think about the timing for both of those books, this was a man who was really uh, at the forefront of what was happening. Uh, Coyle was also the author of Future Scan, the award-winning annual report on industry trends sponsored by the American Hospital Association and the American College of Healthcare Executives. He gave more than 50 seminars and speeches to national healthcare organizations and clients a year. Think about that, okay? <laughs> the man was on the road, okay? Uh, so, so with the legacy of these two leaders, I want to thank our speakers for today. Uh, as this year's Gibbs Order, we welcome Paul Levy, Senior Advisor at Lax Sabanius, LLC. We also welcome our COIL lecturer, Dr. Lena Wen, who is the Visiting Professor of Health Policy and Management and Distinguished Fellow at our Fitzhugh Mullen Institute of Health Workforce Equity here at the Milken Institute School of Public Health. Dr. Wen is also the former Health Commissioner for the City of Baltimore and the former president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Federation of America. We also have, and I think you heard all names earlier, but we have our young alumni presenter, uh, Benjamin Tingey, class of 2014. Do I have Tingey right, I hope? Thank you, good. Uh, <laughs> who returns to share his experience as an early careerist with us. Um, so I welcome you all to this year's Gibbs Oration and COIL lecture, and Please join me in welcoming the Michael and Lori Milken Dean here at the Milken Institute School of Public Health, Dr. Lynn Goldman. Good afternoon. I also am, am delighted to welcome everyone here today for the 29th Gibbs Oration, the 13th Russ Coyle Lecture, and the 17th Young Alumni Presentation. These annual lectures are a tradition of our health management program, and I am so pleased to see everyone here today. Our health management program has been educating and training healthcare administrators and providers for nearly six decades, starting with the vision of Frederick Gibbs. From his early nurturing of a unique idea, actually training students in hospitals, to our programs now, both residential and online, I could not be more proud as dean of how this trailblazing program has evolved over the years. I'm particularly pleased to see three of our emeritus faculty members um, here today. I know that Dr. Richard Southby is here, Dr. Bob Burke, who I saw earlier, who I assume is here um, somewhere, and Dr. Kurt Darr, who I've been told is on his way. <laughs> Each of you has made a tremendous impact on this program and how it has developed into one of the best in the nation. The program's tremendous leap up in the rankings, four spots this year, is indicative of the contributions each of you made to ensure this program's storied legacy. Thank you. Many thanks as well today to today's three speakers. I'm delighted to hear from each of them, and I'm certain Paul, Lena, and Ben's talk this afternoon will give us a great deal to think about and discuss at this evening's reception. Paul, I know that we're all keen to hear your perspective as a former hospital CEO. I know that Lena's courage and passion for public health and health equity will inspire us all. And Ben, we're especially looking forward to your interactive and engaging talk at 4 p.m. about healthcare in innovation. Again, we are so fortunate to have such a wonderful lineup of speakers today. I hope you enjoy the afternoon of lectures and I hope to see old friends and make new ones as the day goes by. It is now my pleasure to turn things over to Bob to introduce Paul Levy. Thank you, Dean Goldman. Paul F. Levy is an author, a speaker, and corporate advisor. He served as the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston from January of 2002 to January of 2011. Uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, as you may well know, is one of the world's preeminent academic health centers. It provides state-of-the-art clinical care and research and teaching in affiliation with the Harvard Medical School. 
licensed for over 600 beds, Beth Israel annual revenues were over $1.4 billion. So clearly, um, Paul has run some big operations. Uh, we're happy to have him here today, and without any further ado, it is my tremendous pleasure and honor to introduce Paul Levy. Paul. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bob. It's an honor to be here with you today. Um, before I dive into the talk, I just want to give a little bit more personal background so you know where I'm coming from in all this. Uh, I'm relatively new in the healthcare world. Before the BIDMC job, I, for a few years, I was administrative dean at Harvard Medical School. But before that, I was teaching at MIT. And before that, I was running a large organization called the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, which is the water and sewer agency for the Boston metropolitan area. And in that capacity, I was running a project called the Boston Harbor Cleanup Project um, to uh, remediate the, the pollution of Boston Harbor. It was a $4 billion project that um, actually came in, unlike most public projects, ahead of schedule and under budget. Um, the key to doing that, by the way, is to project long and high <laughs> and, and, and come under. Um, and before that, I was a regulator. I used to regulate the utilities in Massachusetts, the electricity, natural gas, and telephone companies. <clears throat> and before that, does this sound like I couldn't hold on to a job? Before that, um, I was actually Secretary of Energy for Bill Clinton in Arkansas for a couple of years. Go Hogs. Um, and uh, before that, had been in Massachusetts working for Mike Dukakis in the state energy office there. So um, the healthcare world came around for me in that um, there had been a merger between Beth Israel Hospital and New England Deaconess Hospital. And, um, and unlike and like most mergers, it failed. Um, by the way, one thing you should know about mergers is they're not mergers. It's always an acquisition by one company over another. And in this place, you had two very distinguished hospitals who, for various reasons, decided to get together. And the cultural differences between them, just think about the name, Beth Israel Hospital, New England Deaconess Hospital, the Jews and the Methodists. What's the chance that's going to work out, right? <laughs> uh, at, at, the first, at the first meeting, the first joint meeting of the trustees, where they had trustees from both hospitals, there were two reactions from the trustees. The, the, the Jewish board members from the, from the BI said, how come we're starting on time? <laughs> and and the, the, uh, the, um, the old Yankee families who would, that's Yankee in the Boston sense, not in the New York sense, the Yankee families of, of New England who would run the Deaconess Hospitals came to that first board meeting and said, what's all this food doing here? <laughs> okay, so, so, if, if the trustees couldn't even talk to one another, what was the chance the rest was going to work out? And it didn't work out. And the place went into a tailspin, lost, losing tens of millions of dollars, burning up a fifth of the endowment uh, and, and the like. And, um, and they needed a new CEO. And frankly, nobody in the healthcare world wanted the job. And they figured, well, maybe this guy Levy would be OK. So I guess I'd run the sewer system, so I should run a hospital. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Um, but I went in, and, and first career lesson for you is this. If you ever get a chance to go in a situation where you're doing the turnaround, say yes. It, you might view it as a high-risk situation, but it's really not a high-risk situation personally. Because if you succeed, you're a hero. And if you fail, you just blame the previous person. But chances are you'll figure out how to succeed. And the, the, measure, the, the, the trick to succeeding is figure out what the previous person did and do the opposite. And it's likely to work. <clears throat> so I did that. And then uh, I'm explaining all this because it, it provides a perspective where I'm coming from on the, on the talk. After we did the turnaround, we had to decide what were we going to stand for as an institution in Boston, a highly competitive healthcare market where you have five or six academic medical centers within about a two-mile radius. Well, you have, there's no statutory right to exist as a nonprofit hospital system. So what, what would we do? And I was very fortunate to, to recruit a terrific chief of medicine named Mark Rydell from UPMC, 
who was passionate about improving quality and safety for our patients. And, and he showed up, and he got to work on that. You know, he arrived one day and he said, we have too many central line infections here. And I said, you do? He said, yeah, well, we're going we're to drive this to zero. And he did, along with everybody else. And then he said, we have too many cases of ventilator-associated pneumonia here. We're going to drive that to zero. We didn't quite get to zero, but we did a lot. All, all those kinds of things. And my role in that was just to support him, one, to hire him, two, to support him. But I also started writing a blog around that time, which was called Running a Hospital. And I started to tell the story of what we were doing, including posting clinical outcomes in real time for the world to see. Our rate of central line infections, month by month, in real time, and the like. Well, little did I know that the world would end if you did that, if you started being so transparent about outcomes. You know, patients wouldn't come, you'd be sued more often, doctors wouldn't want to work there, and the like. Well, guess what? The world didn't end. In fact, quite the contrary happened. What happened <coughs> was our people were proud of the fact that we were talking about all this stuff publicly because it indicated the level of our commitment to that kind of internal change in the hospital. So lesson number two, radical transparency, as it was later called, was an extremely powerful management and leadership tool that got everybody on board, everybody heading in the same direction. Well, around that time, I got a call. As I took the job, I got a call from a fellow named David Garvin at Harvard Business School saying, Paul, we'd like to do a case study of your turnaround with the IBMC. And um, he said, usually we do case studies after the fact. Two years later, when the CEO can reinterpret what he or she did to make themselves look better, uh, we'd like to do yours simultaneously. We'd like to videotape you every six weeks for two or three hours for the first six months you're in the job, and you're to tell us what you're doing and why, and in the next interview, how it, how it went and what you're going to do next, and we want access to all your emails and everything else. And I said, gee, David, that sounds like a great teaching tool. Sure, I'd be really interested, but you know, there's a chance I may not succeed. And he says, better yet. We're, we're academics. We don't care if you succeed or not. We just want a good case study. So they did that case study, which, is, which it turns out now is the, the, the most popular case study at Harvard Business School. It's used all over the world. And I find myself walking through Madrid one day, and a, gr a group of young adults coming up after me saying, Mr. Levy, Mr. Levy, we just saw you in our class. So all over the world. I've achieved some notoriety between the blog and the case study. But it, all of that experience really made me appreciate the environment within, <clears throat> within which academic medical centers and community hospitals and the like are working, and also made me understand a bit more about the structure of an industry, which, as you know, is highly complex. And, and so I want to give some observations about that today. Now, in these observations, um, there's, a, there's a good amount that's actually discouraging. But I'm hoping to end up with something a bit inspiring. I don't want you leaving the room all depressed. Um, but, but I think we have to understand in this field, there's a tremendous amount of inertia and um, structural support for the way things are. And so making change to the way things are is quite a task. Now, if Jeff Bezos were here and we were talking about Amazon, and we said, Jeff, we're a bit concerned at the percentage of GDP that Amazon is starting to represent in, in the United States. It seems to be a growing percentage of GDP. I'm really nervous about that. Or if uh, Zuckerberg were here and we said the same thing to Facebook. Or, or frankly, if the head of General Motors were here and, and they, were, they happened to be growing for change. And, and, and gee, the auto industry is taking up a bigger, bigger share of, the, of, of GDP. We, and we said, gee, that's a terrible thing. And they would look at you like you're crazy. We said, well, that's our strategic plan, is to grow faster than the economy as a whole. You think Walmart cares about that? You think Procter & Gamble? Of course they want to grow faster than the economy as a whole. That's what their shareholders want. But it seems that when we talk about healthcare in that way, with the growing percentage of, of, um, of uh, healthcare as a percentage of GDP, people get really upset by that. 
and interesting to think about that. So I'm going to present you with a different view. And here it is. We are twice as efficient as the rest of the world in extracting money from other sectors and sending it to the healthcare sector. Isn't that good news? Well, I guess it depends where you are. You've all seen this chart, you know, we're spending, this is 19, 2017 numbers, <clears throat> 10,000 bucks a year in the US compared to the comparable countries of 5,000. Twice, twice. Well, there's been, been a lot of talk about why that is and what we should do about that. Tremendous focus on, <clears throat> remember when Obama created Obamacare, he says, um, I'm gonna give you access and I'm gonna give you choice and I'm gonna give you lower costs. And I remember doing a blog post around that time saying, sorry, Mr. President, you only get two out of three. If you're gonna give people access and choice, you're not gonna control costs. And if you're gonna give them access and lower costs, you're not gonna give them choice. But that was the story he spun at the time and it created a perception in the body politic that you could actually do something about costs. And it led to some interesting, and I would say, not so well thought through experiments. Like CMS saying, we're gonna charge you a penalty if your readmission rate is higher than average. And I looked at that and I said, oh my God, all this is gonna do is it's gonna hurt the safety net hospitals because their clientele do not have the support in their homes and their communities to avoid readmission. And sure enough, a few years later, Ashish Jha and his friends at Harvard uh, School of Public Health published articles saying, gee, look what the readmission penalty has done. It's hurt the poor hospitals. So there's a lot that's come through in a policy sense that's you know, based on good intentions. But we often end up with unexpected or untoward results. There's a cartoonist named Michael Lunig in, in uh, Melbourne, Australia, and this is one of my favorite cartoons that, he's, that he drew. It seems to me it's kind of the story of the world. You know, we see a complex problem, all these moving parts. We get to work hammering it together and we build our structure. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves in the box. Um, and then we're stuck there for, for a while. So, you know, I'm a public policy nut. And I, I would say, well, if we want to change things in society, if we really, really want to change things about healthcare costs, who's going to do that? And why would they participate? After all, one person's costs is another person's income. So we, if we want to control costs, we're, we're going to be taking away from somebody, probably, unless we can achieve tremendous efficiencies in a way that doesn't take away. By the way, in a hospital, we demonstrated that by improving quality and safety, you actually create those efficiencies. We were able to reduce our costs of operations and actually be more profitable as a result. But the industry as a whole may not feel the same way. So let's think about who cares about healthcare costs. You know, you, know, you might think it's the hospitals. Anyone thinks, think hospitals care about controlling costs? I think, for the most part, hospitals are cost centers in search of revenue streams particularly, if I may so, to my friends in academic medicine, particularly academic medical centers. Clay Christensen, a few years ago, wrote a book about health, the healthcare industry. And in it, he pointed out that in general hospitals, including academic medical centers, how much overhead is there for every dollar of service delivered? How much? Nine dollars of overhead for every dollar of service delivered. There's no other industry in the world that behaves that way. Why does it happen in the hospital environment? Well, it tends to be organized vertically, first of all. And, um, you know, uh, when something gets added, usually nothing gets taken away. Something's always added and added. And, and um, the, the bigger it gets, the more complex it gets, the more inefficiencies get built into, into things. And those of you who've worked in hospitals, uh, either as clinicians or interns or, or whatever, have probably noticed that <clears throat> if I'm a nurse or a doctor or a transporter pushing a bed or whatever, there are a lot of things that go on 
in the way work is done in a hospital that get in the way of my doing my job. And so what do I do? What do the well-intentioned people in hospitals do, the doctors and nurses and so on, who are so dedicated to carrying out their tasks, when they encounter something that gets in their way, they invent a workaround to get through it. And the underlying systemic problem was not solved. Example, in our hospital, we had, uh, um, well, they're everywhere. There was PCA pumps. You know, the pumps that patients use to control their own morphine drip within limits. And uh, <clears throat> those are really useful tools. Right? They're very important. So, uh, so a patient comes up from the, uh, from the operating room, goes into room 515. The well-intentioned caring nurse goes into the room, wants to install a PCA pump, looks around, can't find a pump. So the nurse goes out to the front desk and says to the nurse manager, I need a pump for Mrs. Smith in room 515. The nurse manager says, uh, uh, I think I saw one down at the end of the corridor. And so the nurse walks to the end of the corridor, interrupting other nurses as, as they walk down the, the corridor. Have you seen a pump? No, I haven't seen a pump. Comes back to the nurse manager, I can't find a pump. Well, call Central Supply. So the nurse calls Central Supply, gets somebody down there and says, I need a pump on, in room 515. Person in Central Supply says, well, I'm cleaning and charging them right now. I'll get one up as soon as I can. And the nurse, the well-intentioned caring nurse says, what do you mean as soon as I can? What does that mean? Well, as soon as I can. In fact, if you would get off the phone, I could get it done faster. And the nurse, getting very frustrated, has now spent 20 minutes on this, goes to the fourth floor, goes to their storage closet, and steals a pump from the fourth floor where they've been hoarding it so that they will have one, and goes back to the room and finally installs it, having wasted a half hour, and interrupted other people in their work. Well, in our hospital, a nurse actually pointed out that this was happening. And so as a result, we co totally revamped what was going on in our hospital in terms of inventory and charging and the pumps and so on, and we, had, we fixed it so that from that time on, when a nurse needed a PCA pump, there was always one cleaned and charged within 15 feet of the central desk, and it could be installed within 30 seconds or a minute, saving a tremendous amount of time. Now, when I've told that story to hospital people around the world, everybody said, yeah, that's the way it is in our place. And I say to them, how many of you fixed it? And all the hands go down. So that, in part, is what explains the tremendous overhead burden in these hospitals. By the way, as a result of that change, we were about to buy a new set of pumps for the whole hospital. We had budgeted $6 million for that. We only had to spend $5 million because we were making more efficient use of what we had. But most places just don't do that. So these hospitals, they also think they have to build new buildings to, to keep up with the Joneses, with the competition. They also think they have to buy the latest equipment and, and this and that. And they end up with tremendous overhead, tremendous costs, at which point, in order to stay solvent, they're constantly searching for revenue streams. <clears throat> One of the things they do then is they acquire other hospitals in the community. And they concentrate the market, in part, so they can have more leverage over insurance companies so they can get higher rates to pay for all the stuff they do. So we can't really expect the hospitals to do much in terms of cost control. Pharmaceutical companies, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this one. Okay. I'm not saying that the people in pharmaceutical companies are poorly intentioned. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, I know many of them, and particularly the scientists. They are deeply devoted to what they do. They're trying to find the, the cure to this or that or whatever. The approval process they have to go through is extreme and difficult. It costs hundreds of millions of dollars to get something on the market. But these are profit-making companies, and they don't do that willy-nilly. They have a strategic plan, and their strategic plan is to be first to the market with the latest drug so they can jack up the price on it as long as possible. So we're not going to expect much from them. Now, it might very well be that some of those drugs result in a lower lifetime cost in treating patients. We had that with the, with the hepatitis drug. Uh, I forget the name of it a, few, a couple of years ago, right? That was, that was going to avoid uh, liver transplants. So in terms of long-term cost effectiveness, some of those drugs make a difference in that. But short-term, boosting up. 
And many of the drugs that are introduced actually do not have a long-term cost advantage in terms of lifetime cost. So I don't think we can expect the pharma industry to, to help us on costs. <clears throat> Technology companies. Again, you know, they're not in the business to lose money. Here's my favorite one, Intuitive Surgical, invented the Da Vinci robot and did a spectacular job marketing it and engaging doctors and selling for them and the like. Billions of dollars in revenue, billions of dollars worth of these, these machines in operating rooms around, around the country. Are they clinically efficacious? Apparently not so much. But they became important or perceived as important in terms of competitive advantage by doctors and, and hospitals. When I was at DIDMC, my urologist came in one day, a great urologist. Paul, we need to buy a Da Vinci robot. And I said, gee, guys, you know, there's no evidence that the, that the clinical results are any better. And the machine costs a million dollars. And then there are the disposables you have to buy and the maintenance contract and all this. And by the way, when you do surgery with this machine in, in, our, in our OR, the surgery takes longer because of the setup. And by the way, also, because, um, because of the way it's set up on the, the patient's body, the anesthesiologists tell me that if there's an airway problem, it's actually more difficult for them to get in quickly to solve the airway problem for a patient that's being operated on by using one of these machines. So why on earth would we want to do this? It's going to be expensive. It's going to, it's going to essentially eliminate the profit margin for the hospital from the surgery. Patients aren't going to be better off. Why would we want to do it? And they actually said to me, yep, you're right. But the guys across the street are buying one. And if we don't have it, our patients are going to go over there. And by the way, our residents, or our prospective residents in surgery, believe this is the wave of the future. And if we don't have a machine, they won't come to our residence apartment. So one of my favorite blog posts is entitled Uncle, where I basically told the story and said, I give in. And we spent a million dollars on this useless machine. So there should be a case study about intuitive surgical and how effective they were in pulling that off. By the way, they did not go to the academic medical centers first. They went to the small community hospitals in Florida and other places where the local urologists could brag about having this machine. And there'd be billboards about it with testimonials from Mr. So-and-so. I went doctor to Dr. Smith. and. He used a Da Vinci robot, and, and it worked. And um, you know, it was on prostate surgery. So you know, with men, all you have to do is tell them that there's low, lower risk to something involving their penis, and they're going to want it, right? <laughs> right? So th this, this spread like wildfire. And then the academic centers brought on. But it's not just the equipment manufacturers that are out there increasing the cost. It's the IT folks. This is the corporate headquarters of Epic in Wisconsin. Epic has, has ridden, has ridden the, uh, the money wave coming from the federal government and hospitals and has produced a very interesting system for electronic health records, which is extremely expensive and non-responsive to clinicians' needs and has itself added cost, assuming, even assuming that the software works properly, Talk to any doctor who has tried to do medis medication reconciliation using an EPIC system. Okay? You know, you go in, you, you go into the, pa the doctor, and they produce a list of all the medications you're on. They're required to do that. Well, the list that comes out of EPIC is just a list. It's not chronological. It's, it draws from every database, and it just spews out a list, pages long, of what medications you might have been on some point in your life, basically. Not your life, but in recent history. And so then the doctor has to spend an incredible amount of time, wasted time, going over a useless list with you. Why couldn't they adjust that? Well, they don't, they don't want to. It's like the old line from uh, Lily Tomlin uh, the, um, working for the phone company years ago. We're the phone company. We don't have to care because they, they don't have a monopoly situation, but they have a dominant situation. And they've done very well. <clears throat> Insurers, well, we would think the insurance companies would want to control costs, right? No. Under the law, they're allowed to keep 15% of the premium dollar 
for G G and A and profit. So guess what happens as premium dollars go up? They get more. They really have no incentive to control costs. Employers, now you would think employers would care because they're paying their share. What they care about, they don't care about health care costs per se, they care about what portion they have to pay. So what they've done is they've shunted costs off to us. They've developed um, high deductible health plans, for example. And they've come to you saying, you know, if you stick with the regular plan, it's going to go up 10 or 12% next year. But if you take this high deductible plan, it will only go up 4 or 5% next year. I think you should do that. So you, you come back home and you discover that you have a fixed $6,000 deductible before the insurance kicks in for your family. You're paying it, not the company. Whoops, uh-oh, what did I do? And they also have invented wellness programs, so-called wellness programs. Oh, Bob, you're so lucky you can sign up for a wellness program and get a better price on your health insurance through us. Now, here's the deal, though. You have to disclose to us your personal health information, not only your weight and you know, the rest, but we want to know about your diet and your exercise. And if you qualify for this wellness program, we'll give you a discount. But if you don't, you won't. In fact, you might get a penalty. So again, this is a cost-sharing thing. And what do you do to people with people with chronic health conditions who can't take advantage of the wellness programs, they get stuck. So this is all cost shifting. So what, what I'm saying to you is there are not tremendous incentives to, uh, to act on health care costs. You would think the federal government would be involved, but let me tell you something about the federal government. This is a picture of a proton beam machine. You all know about proton beam machines? These are machines that were designed to deal with specific types of very difficult to handle tumors they're very expensive technology. <clears throat> but then someone discovered, some financial analysts discovered that because of the way Medicare prices the use of proton beam machines, which gives an extra boost over the normal rate, gee, if you start using it for prostate tumors and other things, you can also get that rate. And then those finance people went to health systems around the United States and sold them on this investment. Oh, your hospital can have a proton beam machine. I know there only should be three or four in the country, but maybe there should be 20 or 30 in the country instead. So now we have an installed base of hundreds of millions of dollars of proton beam machines that are not necessary. And who made that possible? Congress and the administration. I talked to a friend who, let's just say, was in a high administrative position in CMS, whom some of you know. And I said, how could you let this persist as a policy? And this person was in a position to change the policy. <coughs> and they said to me, I think you know why. And the answer was political pressure. So there was a policy that added hundreds of millions to the installed base of healthcare costs in America, where one person could have made the difference just by saying, we're not going to pay you a premium anymore to use a, pro, a proton beam machine to, to shoot a prostate cancer tumor and felt that they wouldn't be backed up by their administration or the Congressional Oversight Committee if they did that. I hope you're not getting too discouraged. So my friend Ashish Jha, along with two other people whose names I can't pronounce, wrote an article a little while ago looking at what are the components of healthcare costs in, in America? The United States spent approximately twice as much as other high income countries on medical care, yet utilization rates, utilization rates in the US were largely similar to those in other nations. Prices of labor and goods, including pharmaceuticals and administrative costs, appeared to be the major drivers of the difference in overall cost between the US and other high income countries. They conclude, as patients, physicians, policymakers, and legislators actively debate the future of the US health system, data such as these are needed to inform policy decisions. Really good article, very helpful. Where does it go from there? Well, I think, I think it doesn't go anywhere for the reasons I've already said. Some of you will recognize this device. This is where we do an age stratification in the room. Raise your hand if you recognize this device. 
there we go, one. This is what used to be in the wall of your home if you wanted to plug in an extension telephone in the days when people had telephones with wires on them. And the thing about the, there was a four prod plug and you could move your phone around the house to plug it into different places if you wanted. The legacy of the Bell system was you had to pay the phone company every month for every jack that was in your house. Every jack. Think about it. This is like if you had to pay the electric company for every socket in your house. That's the way the phone system worked at the time. It was a monopoly. They could do whatever they want. And the shorthand for what they could do was, if you can name it, you can price it. And then they would charge us for that. I think we have a bit of that here. We've endorsed this view of the world that if you're in the healthcare world, in essence, if you can name it, you can price it. <clears throat> Why is that? And as we think about these policy measures that Ashish and everybody talked about that we want to change to make things more efficient, lower cost, let's look at the inertia in the way of doing that. Every one of you in this room could take on one of these tasks for the next 10 or 15 years and it would be a worthwhile use of your time in terms of, of the, the United States. I'm giving you this as a list of things to work on. I'm also telling you they're going to be hard. Number one, we've had very lax antitrust enforcement with regard to market concentration. Um, um, hospitals are merging to create more market power so they can beat up on the insurance company. They say to you, we're doing it to integrate clinical care over the catchment area we serve. I'm not allowed to use profanity here. Let's just say that's not the case. First of all, there's no indication that they are integrating the care. But what they're really trying to do is have leverage over the insurance company. There's a fellow named Martin Gaynor at um, uh, Carnegie Mellon who has written papers about the impact of market concentration on the cost of health care in those cities, on the price of health care in those cities, not the cost, the price uh, in those cities where it's happening. Very powerful uh, article. Failure to apply cost effectiveness standards to new drugs and technology. In the UK, when a new drug or technology is going to be introduced to the national health system, there's a committee called NICE. I love the acronym. How can you go wrong with a committee called NICE? And it, it stands for Clinical Effectiveness, National something for Clinical Effectiveness. And before the uh, NHS is allowed to use the thing, it has to be shown to be clinically uh, efficacious and also financially um, efficient. We only do half of that here. The FDA does the clinical effectiveness part. And I think, I think they do that pretty well. But there is no cost effectiveness standard in place in the US. In fact, once the FDA has approved something, CMS basically has to pay for it. Uneven adoption of clinical process improvement. These are the kinds of things I was talking about before that we did in our hospital. <clears throat> if you look around the world, around the country, when it comes to clinical process improvement, which I would term as uh, reducing or, eliminated un, uh, or eliminating unwanted, unwarranted clinical variation, unwarranted clinical variation, that there's been very uneven adoption of that. What we have is islands of excellence in a sea of mediocrity. Maybe five to 10% of the hospitals in the US care about this. If you t look at a survey of hospital administrators, what do you want to spend your time on? This doesn't even show up on most of their lists. But it's extremely powerful. Again, it's the kind of thing you might be interested in. Find a place that wants to do it. Go there. It's a great experience. Failure to let CMS negotiate drug prices. We know about that. Failure to insist on interoperability of EHRs. So the federal government has just spent billions of dollars encouraging and subsidizing hospitals and, and doctor's offices to put in EHRs, and the systems don't talk to each other. They did not make that a requirement. What does that do? It creates friction for patients. If I'm part of one, if I go to my primary care doctor and uh, need a referral to a specialist, 
and I want to go to one who's in a different health system, it makes it more different, difficult to transfer my electronic medical record. I had a friend who was, had some images taken at Beth Israel Deaconess, but he was going to get his care taken care of at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, approximately 400 feet apart. And they said, well, you can put in a request to have your records faxed over. First of all, he, he wanted his images. You're going to fax the images over? So what he did is he walked across the street and, and had a, a, a thumb drive made from the BID system and took it over to the Brigham system. Come on. And both have in place very advanced EHRs, but they don't talk to each other. The hospital systems working with the EHR vendors have intentionally not made their systems interoperable. Intentionally. It's part of their market strategy, again, with regard to market concentration, creating friction so that patients can't move around. So there is not free choice. And failure to provide price transparency. If we're going to give people high deductible health plans so that they, quote, have skin in the game and shop around, for that MRI or whatever it is, or their surgery before they have it, they need to be able to shop around. Have you ever tried to shop around for anything like this? Massachusetts has a law saying that hospitals have to let you know what it will cost you for X, Y, and Z, whatever you might want. Even in the state of Massachusetts where that's the law, when you ask, for the most part, you don't get it. First of all, you have to exactly specify what you want in medical terms. And secondly, often a hospital doesn't have in place a uh, pricing system that could let you know what it will cost. And they're not actually allowed to tell you what they charge the insurance company. They have to tell you what they would charge you. So it depends on which insurance company you have or if you're insured and so on. So all of that is, I'm sorry to say, is failing right now. Please, one of you, take each one of these and solve this problem. I'm reminded when I, when I was a student at MIT, I had a wonderful physics professor named Hale Brott who was an astrophysicist. And he was teaching us physics, electromagnetism, and all these wonderful things. But in, a, in, in his real life, he was an astrophysicist. And he came in one day and he showed us this beautiful picture taken of outer space. And it was of the uh, Crab Nebula. And there was a star out there. He said, here's a picture of this star. Here's a picture of this star a 20th of a second later. It's gone. Here's a picture of this star a 20th of a second later. It's on again. He said, we just noticed this thing. It's called a pulsar. It goes on and off, on and off. He said, we haven't figured out how it works. Maybe one of you can. So I haven't figured out how these work yet. But maybe one of you can. Please, do it. Any, any one of those you can solve will be great. But what I would suggest to you today is unless we address those issues, and the reason I would really like you to address those issues, is because the, the big debates we're having about Medicare and all and other structural changes are basically a distraction. They don't get to the underlying structural issues that we're currently facing. Yes, maybe Medicare for all could save administrative costs, but as we've seen in the debate, there are other costs that come out of that. <coughs> um, uh, for example, making things free might cause people to use more health care uh, than they currently use. Um, so my fear is that if, if we rush willy-nilly nilly into adopting one of these, which we're not going to because of deadlock in Congress anyway, but um, what we'll end up with is a different structure that will just uh, result in different forms of rationing. Um, and a parallel system for the well-to-do in society. That's basically what we have in England right now, in, in Great Britain. We have the national health system, um, which works very well in certain respects, but does not work well in other respects. And parallel to the national health system, for the wealthy people, there's a private health system in place. Same in Israel, the same in a lot of, part of the, parts of the world. So I don't mean to diss that as an issue in the presidential campaign, because I know it's going to get a lot of attention. But to me, it's off the point compared to these other things that are more important. I would say, in addition to focusing on those particular aspects that are of interest to you where you think you can make a difference, 
I think it's also time to return to basics with regard to public health. So there's a tendency in the debates on health care to focus on the acute care sector. But I think that distracts us from potential public health improvements. I think the acute care sector is something like the acute care in hospitals is something like 20% of the health care budget, something like that. Uh, the WHO's, uh, uh, you can read papers on this, says, to a large extent, factors such as where we live, the state of our environment, genetics, our income and education level, and our relationships with friends and family all have considerable impacts on health, whereas the most more commonly considered factors such as access and use of health care services often have less of an impact. I think it's important to remember that. So if we, if we go back to our, our our hope of improving the public health system, and we're talking about building a constituency to do that, I think it's interesting to look a little bit of it at the political environment. What's getting in the way? Is public health a democratic or a Republican issue? Is it a liberal or a conservative issue? Is it urban or rural? Is it male or female or whatever other genders you want to put in? Is it white or brown? And the answer, of course, it's all of it. It's all of that. So if we're looking for something that could potentially unify America, maybe this is it. Maybe of all the issues facing the body politic today, improvement of public health has the most potential to cross political, geographic, and other lines that currently divide the country. I think we're all searching for something that can bring us together. Maybe this is it. I don't know. So my charge to you, in this election year in particular, but going beyond that, let's use our personal engagement in the process to advocate for a stronger commitment and investment in this arena, in the public health arena. How you use, choose to do that is your choice. But don't let them get you caught up in all this minutia about the acute care sector when there's this bigger thing outside that will make it, potentially could make a huge difference for our society. Bob, that's all I have to say. Thank you for having me very much. Thank you, Paul. I was just wondering if any of you have any uh, questions, because if you have the questions, Paul has the answers, right? Especially about sewage, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but I think it's, that's kind of a hard thing to swallow, because it seems more and more that the more conservative parts of our country are less concerned with social determinants of health, and maybe the things that impact public health. And so, I don't know, I'd just be curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, I, I, I think, um, I'm not sure it's just conservatives who feel that way, first of all. Um, I, I'm not sure it's a, it's a political spectrum divide. Uh, it, there are a lot of ways to cut and chop the population. There's political spectrum divide, there's class divide, there's racial divides, there's urban and, and all the rest. And, and look, I, I, I advise people on negotiation in my real life. Um, I'm always happy to do talks like this, but I go around the world advising institutions and companies and governmental bodies on negotiation. And the first rule of negotiation, which gets to your question, very often people go into negotiation saying, how am I going to get the best deal for myself or get done what I want to get done? What they tend to do is to not pay sufficient attention to what might be the underlying interests of the other party. So whether it's someone of a conservative political background or rural or lower income or whatever it is, I think part of our task, part of your task, is to figure out what might be important to them in their everyday lives. And then your job is to help draw the nexus between that and what you're trying to get through in the way of policies or programs. It's not easy. It's particularly not easy because the level of civic discourse, has, as you know, has really just fall, fallen to pieces. So I think what I'm urging is empathy. If someone is, ex is responding angrily to you to a particular approach, 
a particular issue. There's a reason for that. They feel threatened. Who knows what's going on in their home life or whatever. Our task is to take that in in kind of a, you know, when you catch a baseball, you don't hold your mitt here. You bring it back as it comes in, right? Take that in. Try to understand what they're saying. Be responsive by saying things like, gee, I can understand why you might be upset about that. Show that you actually care and understand. And then try to take the discussion a bit further. I'm not saying it's easy. I absolutely know it's not easy. I've been involved in those discussions in my own hometown, in my state, and nationally, and in other countries. But the most effective negotiators, and you are all negotiators when you're trying to do this stuff, are the people who, who at heart are able to display empathy with your counterparties. Other questions? Dr. Helmkin. Sure. Hi. Uh, Lawrence Helmkin. I'm an associate professor here in the department. Uh, do you think Obamacare is broken? If so, how? And how would you fix it? I, I, I actually. I, I didn't think it was broken at all. I think there were minor tweaks that need to be made. But I thought Obamacare did what it said it was going to do. And not what the president said it was going to do, but, but the way the law was written. I mean, we, we had many more people covered. Um, uh, it gave people access to care who didn't have it before. Uh, it solved a lot of the financial issues of free care in the hospitals and, and all the rest. And uh, I thought it was working pretty well. Um, I think one of the, the tragedies is that I, I think, uh, I really admired Obama as a president, but I think he didn't do a very good job selling what he had achieved in that legislation. He permitted the other party, in essence, to demonize the result when he, had pro he and the Congress had produced something pretty spectacular. Um, and so, he let them take the agenda. Um, and, and, um, but I think we could have gone on for a long time with it and then gradually improving over time. So I think, I think it was a lost opportunity. It was a shame. I, uh, <clears throat> I hate to uh, truncate the discussion, but uh, I think we're going to have to move on. But I did want to present you with some bling. OK, before good. We go. uh, I love bling. Yeah, um, Paul F. Levy. Is it a Red Sox? Oh, no. Uh, no. <laughs> Forget it. They still, they still have a, do they have a ball team up there? Uh, not this uh, year. <laughs> right. As recognized. Okay, now we promised we wouldn't okay, get we wouldn't nasty. Do okay. As recognized as, I mean, because you are here in the uh, yeah. home of the uh, World Series country. Oh, was there a World Series this year? <laughs> yeah, there was. Didn't even know they had they that beat, this year. They beat some team from somewhere down in Texas. As recognized as the 29th annual Gibbs Order for exceptional dedication toward improving healthcare through a lifetime of leadership and excellence, the 29th Annual Gibbs Oration and the 13th Annual Coil Lectureship, November 8th, 2019. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And you get, in addition to that, oh. a free book by Susan Rice oh. and the unofficial um, the unofficial mascot, the mascot. of the, uh, the the hippopotamus. So Whoa. there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, please. Oh, we have to do a picture. All right. All right. So with the hippo. With the hippo. With the hippo. Right. Okay.